Great. Okay. So um, when we talk about uh, visual journalism, we very often focus on the visual journalists, the people creating the graphics in the newsroom. And I think you know that's a natural thing. You know, we end, we tend to you know empathise more with fellow visual journalists and rebound ideas off each other, uh, collectively improve, um, and that's exciting to see. But one of my challenges since I started at the Financial Times was to think about, actually, the majority of the FT's content is not produced by visual journalists. So if we want to achieve a culture change for, for growing and maturing visual journalism, we need to bring on board those people who are not the visual journalists. And that doesn't mean turning them into chart makers particularly, or people who are experts in creating charts, but to turn them into what I would call competent critics, people who are capable of deconstructing the role of charts, spotting potential for using visual methods in reporting. And so I set myself the challenge of how could we educate the broader newsroom into using sort of visual methods for reporting. And I looked far and wide for some inspiration on what the right way to do this, or an interesting way to do it, and I kind of found these two very difficult to avoid in, in, in kind of, I don't know, does anybody know who these two are? No? This is, um, in the UK, Trini and Susanna were very famous in running like a style makeover show. Yeah, uh, no, they look like them, maybe, but they did. So they do a lot of this sort of stuff, before and after sort of transformation makeovers. And... You know, they do it with men, too. It's not just like a lady makeover thing. And I thought, actually, the really interesting thing about these before and after shows is like, that they take an hour, whereas I could show you before and after very, very quickly. But the actual process of the transformation is actually quite compelling as a narrative in its own right. And so I thought that to kind of bring people along to be a competent critic as far as visualization is concerned that the process of transformation, we could use it in a similar sort of way. So um, what I kind of picked in the sessions that I run at the FT are some examples that we use as kind of worked process transformations. And to start with, I picked this particular example because for two reasons. One, that I did a review of this document for UNESCO, so I knew it quite well. But also, this sort of document, which is like a 40-page PDF from UNESCO, is that very often the sort of input to FT reporting. So an FT reporter would likely get hold of a document like this and then wrestle with, how do I transform this into content for a regular reader, someone who wouldn't read the 40-page document? So it's full of charts that look like this. And so this is our, like, Trini and Susanna before moment. And I can tell, normally, I let people suffer by forcing them to read this chart for... Uh, a minute or two. Uh, we haven't got the time for it, but it's a pretty terrible chart. And so the first thing that we kind of do on the makeover is to kind of alleviate chiropractic uh, re requirements to sort of, hey, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to crick your neck to read it? That would be good. Now, this data that it's showing is the gender parity index of the adjusted net intake rate. Obviously, that means something to most of you in the room. Um, <laughs> You know, titles is something that we want our critics to be tuned into. But more importantly, because there was a question for Catherine about when do you tune into the data, we want people to tune into the data early as part of the critique. And this data is about equality. So on this data, where the, the values go from low to high, actually that's not the way this data works. This data works based on deviation from equality of access to education, and one is a point of equality. So if we get rid of that chart and bring it back with the bars now aligned to the line of equality and annotate to make it clear what that line means, that if we go on the right, that means that more girls are enrolling in education relative to boys, and it's the opposite in the other direction. We bring back this shaded line, this shaded area, which is not referenced in any way on the original graph in terms of what it means. Um, it's just a minor detail, this really. It's just the policy target for equality of access to education. And then we uh, bring back the titles, this time telling us much more clearly about what is this showing me, and then highlight the countries that are currently not meeting the policy target and make it clear 
What does it mean in those countries? So those orange ones are where girls are disadvantaged in access to primary education. And so to bring back the sort of before and after transformation on that graphic, um, stepping through that process is much more uh, didactic than just showing the before and after sketch and saying that's how you do it, to actually go through the rationale of, of how you do that. And so we've got some examples on the session that I do which pick particular themes that I want to try and crack in the newsroom in terms of barriers to increased and more effective use of visuals. Um, in this particular case, when we're talking about how graphics can transform what we call text plus thinking, the transformation means crucially, that you can start to think about the relationship between the graphic and the text. So I'd say that on the transformed version, it's doing a really good job of showing you what and how much. And so your text can then focus on why and so what. Whereas in the first version, it's not doing enough of anything. And so your text is likely to be, you're going to need to be longer and, and more verbose. Um, also, like in the UNESCO report, the first chart's on page 10. You know, there's no reason now that you've got an effective graphic outlining key stories that you can start with the graphic to push it further into the story. Um, and the fact that it's self-contained makes it perfect for social media, which is one of the things that we're interested in, is that the, the, the graphic as a standalone thing can now live in its own right. So the second thing I wanted to show was we're trying to kind of fight off this notion of using graphics to fill space. Like, I've written my text, and I'm just going to leave a little bit of space on the page to brighten it up with a graphic, OK? So uh, a colleague of mine, Chris Campbell, got a request to produce an election map showing where one particular party in the UK finished second in last year's election. And that's the map. And, you know, it's, it's marginally interesting in its own right, you know, but it probably leaves a lot more questions than answers in terms of that political party's performance. Um, so. The notion was, well, why don't we expand this to show where they actually won? And suddenly you've got a whole load of new, new context there. Um, and where did UKIP finish third? And then, well, why, why stop there? Let's put all of the parties on. And then send, from suddenly being in the small little graphic to drop into a narrative, um, the final version is completely turned around, where the graphic becomes the center point in a much more exploratory use of small multiples for graphics. And the text um, takes second billing in a lot of respects to that. So part of the, the critiquing process that we go through is talking to people about tuning into the data early rather than thinking, I need a bubble chart. I wonder what data I can put into it, you know, <laughs> that kind of way around. And so we go through this process of looking at what are the common relationships in data that, as a reporter, I'm likely to be seeing and thinking about how I could highlight that in visual form. And what's interesting is I kind of I beat up a little bit on this UNESCO report because it's so rich with pickings, but this is, this is figure one. And so what we kind of get the, the uh, attendees for the, the competent critic course to do is to kind of deconstruct this in terms of the relationships in the data that there are in it. And so you kind of talk about these sorts of things. You know, the fact that we can compare the size, we can see how things are changing over time, uh, that there are spatial elements in here, that it's part to whole, because one of the regions is the world, and all of the other elements are, are kind of components of it. And in fact, again, it would be possible to rank this data, but it's very difficult to pick the rankings in the way that it's currently transformed. So what we do on the course is say to people, right, part of the competent critic process is to deconstruct the relationships in the data and then prioritize them because they all compete for attention. And what's really interesting is almost without fail, having gone through an extended version of this, when I say to people, what should we transform this into, um, we invariably land at something like a slope chart. And so here, again, we then say, well, can, can we check out, is it possible to see the rankings in this data? Yes, for both years, which we couldn't do in the previous one. Is it possible to see the change over time? Yeah, because angle is giving us that change over time very, very clearly. Um, is it possible to see that part to whole relationship? Yes, by bringing the world out, we can kind of see this story that South and West Asia has crossed the divisional gap. 
um, in that nine-year period. But the magnitude is now relative because I'm not framing the chart at 0% here because I think 0% is an unrealistic value. Uh, if Sub-Saharan Africa was 61% in uh, 2000. And again, like, as m they're trying to sort of say to people, look, if there's a spatial element to the data, only put it on a map if that spatial element is dominant and that's the element that you really want to prioritize. And the interesting thing, again, is if we do our Trini and Susanna comparison, um, we're getting, obviously, more clarity and hierarchy out of the transformed one. But my favorite element of this one is that if I go back to the original version, I said to UNESCO, how many people spotted the really blatant error on your chart, you know, figure one in your end of decade report? And they said, well, what error? No one's talked to me about an error on this chart. And I said, well, you know, the fact that sub-Saharan Africa is labeled as 71 when the value is uh, 61, and, you know, it was kind of, well, no one told us about the error because no one had bothered to invest enough time reading the chart uh, <laughs> to spot it. Um, little things like that, we kind of are a built-in part of this competent critic process. So where has that kind of left us? I mean, it's, it's, it's early days yet, but taking this process of deconstructing data relationships and then thinking about the symbology on the back of it seems like a very simple thing, but it's leading us into some sort of very interesting places. So um, this article that we wrote on changing um, income distribution in the US, let me just try and make this bigger for you. This came out of that process that we wanted to show, look, deconstruct the data in this. We want to show changing income distribution over time. And it became like a compelling part, a driver of that story. And it's just, it's not interactive, it's just a simple looping GIF, but it's prioritizing the elements in the data that we wanted to expose most regularly. And what was really nice about that was, as well as featuring it very prominently in the online piece to kind of drive the narrative of, of, of the online piece, it also existed very, very nicely as a self-contained social media animation as well. It kind of performed very, very well as part of that. And it, so if you like, that's the experience of mapping this kind of competent critic process onto something that we can transform into real outputs. Um, and that's it. It was just a real quick whistle-stop tour. I, any quick questions? I mean, I'm guessing a lot of people in this room are already competent critics, and you'll competently critique my transformed versions. You know, <laughs> this, this never stops. Um, but I think it's a really important thing to do to bring other people along on the ride and not just to be kind of inwardly talking to other visualization experts that we try and expand our arguments and our discussions outwards. Okay, thanks a lot. Any questions for, uh, for Alan here? Yeah. And just a reminder to mention who you are. Hi, I'm, um, yeah. Hi, I'm Jersey Fitcherik. Um, I was wondering, do you give any sort of um, handout or resource for people to refer back to at the end of this kind of training? Or is it just, you know, hope the training is, gives you <laughs> enough common sense principles on its own? So, um, so the, the full session that we do with the, the journalists is, uh, is like a one-hour session where they get like an expanded set of these sort of uh, transformations and some of the supplementary notes about kind of what kind of relationships to look out for in data, what kind of, uh, how do I, once I've decided to show change over time is what I'm really interested in showing, what are my options for, for doing that in terms of symbology. So um, it's kind of like an introductory level thing. They do get some of those materials effectively just like a, a PDF version of, uh, of, of the content. Um, what we want to do is follow up with something more in-depth. There's a limit to how much you can cover in an hour, uh, but it's like a, a starting point for a journey that we hope will lead to more detail. Hi, I'm Garfield Fisher, I'm a recovering statistician. Um, <laughs> and so my, my question with the bar chart on the Sub-Saharan Africa, were they using magic markers? Uh, because I don't know how you could do those bars that way and have 71%, but yet it showed 60. Yeah, so I, I mean, my kind of, my interest in error there 
was about workflow. And I, I suspect somebody was manually labeling values in Illustrator or something, you know, which is obviously a, a nature's warning sign that that's something a, might be, you know, the waste. scope for real error, yeah. That's a waste of Illustrator talent. Yeah. My name is Christopher. Uh, listening to your competent critic thing, it sounds like it's the skill set that the journalists are need to acquire is how to recognize particular patterns in the data that they're working with. Do you see the possibility of some way to automate that recognition and then make suggestions so they can sort of have a, that makes sense? Um, yeah, so this, this is a really interesting idea because um, when we've run this session, some of the value of it is in confirming people's own intuitions, you know, and then there's probably some extra stuff that they pick up along the way which, which helps. Um, what we're very mindful of, though, is we don't want to kind of, we don't want to systematize too early what really should be a fairly free-flowing and, and kind of creative human process. Um, one of the interesting things is when I attend our editorial conferences, you're aware that people are already tuning into the data in some sense or other because of the use of language, the use of prose that they're writing. So if they're referencing things like search, you know, things that are evocative in terms of movements in data, they're already half the way there. Um, and one of the things we want to do is by kind of sowing the seed with people who are not in graphics, it makes our dialogue with those people much easier and hopefully earlier so we can start to conceive the graphics at the same time that we're writing text and so that they can coexist. So I'm worried about throwing too many tools and automation into that too early because it should, you know, I wouldn't encourage people to automate production of their text. You know, people might have some concerns about that, you know. Um, so it's the same sort of thing, I think. Hi, I'm Catherine. Uh, I was wondering if you had any advice on how to keep yourself honest as a visualist and make sure that you're always being the competent critic and not coming up with the bad visualizations. <laughs> Yeah. Um, one of the things I think that really works is uh, just showing your work to people early and often. I mean, I think there's this kind of thing. This, once you've started to, to, to go on the journey of sketching out a graphic, you tune into it in a way that means it makes it very difficult to see it in an impartial, you know, you lose the ability to see it as a, a novice. So kind of exchanging ideas early and kind of show and tell type stuff with colleagues, I think, is really, really important. Um, as is reviewing things once they've published, you know, did it work? Would we use that approach again? Or is there another way around this problem? Because um, there's just not one way to do it, obviously. All right, time for about a couple more. Hi, my name's Miranda, and I had a question about just trying to get like an outsider's uh, viewpoint or someone who's not in Dana journalism or design or whatever. Um, like, how do you go about doing that if you're, say, in a small knit team or you're working on a project that you know might have some confidentiality or the client doesn't want many people to know about it while it's in process? Like, do you do like? Um, you know, get like outside study groups, or like, how would you go about doing that? Um, I mean, that is, it's a really difficult one to answer because it's kind of context dependent. I mean, it's actually really interesting with the, the income distribution one. We had, uh, so the underlying research was done by Pew, and so, but that was, we had kind of like a pre release access to it to, to work with it. And so, if you like, Pew became the only people that we could rebound these ideas off about this is how we were going to. Uh, work with the, the data and, you know, does this stand up to scrutiny? Um, it's great to have that sort of relationship and like a direct relationship with people that you're, you're kind of um, reporting on, but it's just not possible to do it all the time. And so I think that's one of the reasons why interdisciplinary teams work so well, because you know, rather than have five people who are kind of clones of each other, if you've got people who are coming from slightly different backgrounds, even within relatively small groups and small teams, you get that kind of breadth of input into suggestions and ideas. I think that kind of works very, very well. Yeah. Okay, question from, uh, from Twitter, actually, Alan, uh, from KK Malagu uh, at Facebook. Um, 
about being a critic but also having an impact. So do you see a, an interplay between, you know, providing criticism and then does that, how does that affect whether or not you can have an impact or does that interfere with having an impact? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a fair point. And I have to say kind of critiquing it also involves talking about what's good rather than just completely dissing, uh, you know, everything in a graphic that you don't like. The way that I'd like to think of this is that particularly because this is pitched at an introductory level, what this is kind of doing is talking about the musical scales of visual, uh, you know, data graphics. And that obviously to create impact, if you're a composer, if you stick to the scales, your music will very often be boring. But, so, but it's about knowing when to break the rules and kind of what impact is that going to have. So if you like, this is first base. This is like a, an introductory level primer. Um, what we don't want to do is encourage people to break the rules straight away without knowing why they're breaking it. So it's like a, a, a low-level sort of graphical literacy first. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Alan. Another round of applause for Alan. Great. Thank you.